Welcome to this oral history of Dr. Aziz al Hebri. My name is Marie Failinger. I'm from, from Hamlin Law School, and I'm interviewing Dr. al Hebri at the ALS section on women in legal education for its oral history project. We're at the Washington, D.C. Marriott Boardman Park on January 4th, 2015. Aziza, can tell us a little bit about your growing up. Where were you born, and what was your childhood like? I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, I understood that I was born on a Friday. My grandmother was waiting at the door. When my family came in from Friday prayers, she said, Aziza was born. So she chose my name, and it was her name. Uh -huh. And I understand that my mom delivered me right after she had prepared a big banquet. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I grew up in this very big house, a very big garden, uh, with a nanny, but nobody else, basically, and no mom. And I think that's the one thing that stayed with me the rest of my life, um, that I didn't have a mom. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your extended family. You come from a distinguished family in Lebanon. Both my mother's family and my father's family. My mother comes from one of the premier Damascene families. And so when she came to Lebanon, it was like she immigrated to Lebanon. Uh, the two families were related. That's why they were willing to give her to my father. My father is, uh, comes from a family which was, I understand, one of the six founding families of Beirut, historically. Uh, and my grandfather was a very well-known figure as a religious uh, leader uh, who uh, founded the Muslim Scout movement in the world and who did a lot of conflict resolution in the area, including political conflict resolution. And he was very spiritual. He had a very strong Sufi aspect to him. And he had a great effect on my life. On the other side, my mother's family, I, my other grandfather and his cousin, who was my uncle by nursing, this is, um, an idea in Islam where you have a relationship through nursing from a woman, even if she is not your mother, she becomes your mother. They both were also very well-known religious leaders. This uncle by nursing established uh, uh, a very important uh, school for young children. Um, some of them are orphans, some not. So we've always been very concerned about the social aspect of life, whether it was in Damascus or in Lebanon. But the, uh, but the next generation, the children of, you know, my uncles in other words, the children of these sheikhs were in some ways highly secular. Mm -hmm. So I had this really unusual mix of very religious upbringing and very secular um, society around me and community and family, extended family. A mixture of both. And I think that prepared me for my later life. And I must say that Lebanon is exactly, till this day, that mixture of religiosity or spirituality and secularism. We've never really seen a conflict either amongst those two um, attitudes or ways of looking at life or among the different uh, religions. Uh, one of the major religions in Lebanon was and is still is Christianity. And my grandfather, as religious as he was, his partner in business was Christian. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of Christian business friends and Christian family friends. And some of my family married Christians as well. So we are used to a real diverse community, and I grew up appreciating everybody. You lost your mother early, was that? I was about four years old. And how, you said that that affected you quite a lot. Tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know if uh, my memories are accurate, but my memory of my mother is that I came back from school. I used to go to the lycée. I started in French. <laughs> so I used to come home and I was very noisy and rambunctious and she would say, quiet, because she had just had her operation. She mm -hmm. died of breast cancer. Oh. So one day, I was very proud of myself. I got off the bus and ran home and tiptoed to her bed. And I said, I'm quiet. I didn't make any noise. And I held her hand. And there was no reaction. Oh. 
Oh, no. And I looked at her, I said, but I made no noise. And then I looked, and in the corner there were women dressed in black crying, and somebody came and took me away. And I remember that when her funeral happened, you know, a lot of people went. And my uncle brought his driver, and sort of on the side, but I heard him, he said, take her as far away from the procession as you could. I don't want her to see it. And the driver drove around, and then he just couldn't help it. And he went and he parked the car and climbed the wall where everybody was on the other side and I could hear it and I could feel it, but I couldn't see it. So for me, my mother was very special, and, but I never really could grieve her until I was in the US and I was about 35 years old. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's difficult. It's very difficult. So growing up in Lebanon, you went to the Lycée for a while? I went for, to the Lycée for a couple of years, and my, then my father said, you know, I'm going to move you to the American School for Girls. And I said, why? Because they knew my family at the Lycée, and so they treated me well. <laughs> and uh, my father said, no, the future is not for the French, it's for the Americans. Interesting. <laughs> yes. <Wow. laughs> and I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> and he put me in this uh, school, uh, American School for Girls, which was established by evangelists. Mm -hmm. The upper campus had a seminary, mm -hmm. and some of the seminarians would come and uh, give lectures at assembly in the morning. We went to assembly every day, and sometimes I gave the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the, that, you know, that school was very interesting for me. I made some lasting friendships. Many of my friends are still here in the U.S. In D.C. I see them. Uh, we grew up together, all kinds of uh, people, you know, uh, we were all girls, but different social strata, different religious backgrounds, different beliefs. We know how to get along together and we love each other. Yeah, did, were you thinking about either philosophy or law at that time? Never. When did you start to think about that? When my father asked me, you know, I, I graduated, I did very well in high school, especially my Arabic writing was, according to my teachers, was distinguished, and they saw in it something of Gibran Khalil Gibran. Wow. Yeah. So, and I knew I could develop to where I would become a really distinguished writer. And I was already starting to write poetry, but never uh, fiction. So when I graduated and I said to my father, I want to go to university, he said, what for? I said, because I want to be a journalist. I want to write in, you know, in Arabic. And he looked at me and he said, we have the best library in the country, which is true, Arabic books. He said, you can sit here and you can read them and study and become an excellent writer. So I came back a few days later and I said, Dad, I want to be a physicist. And I knew he liked physics. And I said, Dad, we don't have a lab. <laughs> He said, okay, if it's going to be physics, you can go to university. <laughs> Do you think that was because you were a girl? Is that why he didn't want you to go to college? Or? I don't know. You just didn't know? I don't know. But when I said physics, that was the magic word. Okay. So I went and I really did like physics. That would have been, that was my second choice. Sure. I went and the chair of the department was a woman. Salwa Nassar, who was distinguished nuclear physicist, if I remember correctly. And once I got to university, I got distracted by being in a really diverse surrounding, and gender diverse. This is still in Beirut. <laughs> this is still in Beirut, American University. You know, you, you, you didn't have classes all day. You had a few hours here and there to have coffee with your friends. There were boys around. My, that was a whole new world. And I was the top in my high school, and I wasn't the top in the university because I was so distracted. I did not study very much. Mm -hmm. So at one point I decided 
you know, this is not working for me. I want to graduate and you've played so much. So maybe I should just, just go to the arts and find, find the sort of major that I would be able to move most of my credits to from chemistry and physics and so on. So I found out that if I go to philosophy, logic in particular, all my advanced math training would really, you know, set theory and all that would transfer. So I did that. And that was in my junior year. In my senior year, I graduated. <laughs> so in philosophy, did you focus on some particular? Uh, I logic. I just yeah. loved logic. And of course, it fit with my math training. And I missed physics. I miss physics till this day. I wish I done that. I was more serious about it. Uh, but I loved logic. I had an Australian professor. I wish I could remember his name, but he was wonderful and he made logic so easy to understand. So I applied for a master's at AUB and the chairman of my department was Charles Malik. Some, of, some people would remember him as the signatory to the declaration, uh, the UN declaration um, at its founding. And he was a very famous politician and he had also worked with my uncle. They were both ministers in the same cabinet uh, in government. So he looked at me uh, positively, kindly. So I thought I had bombed in the writing mm -hmm. <laughs> part of the exam. They did both writing and oral for, for the VA. So I was sitting there waiting for my oral in, his, in front of his office with my teachers inside. And there was this guy talking to me. He said, you seem nervous. I said, yes, I'm going to have the oral and I don't think I know enough. And he says, don't worry, you'll do just fine. Charles Malik is going to pass you. I said, really? He said, yeah, just do well and he will pass you. Later I found out he was the barber. <laughs> he was just giving me confidence. <laughs> so I walked in and I remember I answered every question they gave me and one I didn't know. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Later they told me they've never seen somebody so relaxed. <laughs> that I would even say, I don't know the answer to this one. Anyway, I passed. And then the, uh, the university actually did not accept me for master's. And Charles Malik said, just go home and get married. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want that. You know, go home and get married. I could have done that like four years ago, five years ago. So a friend of mine, um, a Lebanese, who was enamored by an American exchange student was writing an application to go to the US so that they could be together again. He said, I'm writing an application and I'm going to Wayne State. I said, what is Wayne State? He said, well, I found this, it's near her, so I'm doing this, why don't you come along? I said, fine, but you know, I don't feel like filling an application. He said, I'll do it for you. So he filled out my application, I got accepted, and I came to the U.S. <laughs> but I have to say, the application was really the smallest part of this, because my father would never allow me to leave to the U.S. Right. And uh, that was a struggle. And in the end, my brother, God rest his soul in peace, he was the best brother you could ever hope for. He took care of me ever since I was a child. He was my mother and my brother and my friend. And his name was? Ibrahim. And my first, my, well not my first book, but my first book in law is dedicated to him. Because he kept saying, finish your book. And I couldn't because he was very sick and I stopped writing. Um, but my brother Ibrahim gave me the love and affection I didn't find anywhere else because I didn't have a mother. But he lived abroad in Germany uh, after he became 18. Before that, we were very close all the time. And, you know, our bedrooms were close to each, next to each other. And, you know, we'd play with teddy bears. And, you know, he, he just indulged me. And after he left, he would get me those beautiful gifts from Germany, you know, cl clothes, uh, jewelry, whatever. So 
When he found out that there is resistance uh, to me, to, uh, you know, getting my education abroad, he sat and had a long discussion with my father and he said, I, I will be responsible for her. I take the responsibility. I know my sister. She's a very good person. You don't need to worry. In the end, my father was exhausted by, the <laughs> by that, and he said, okay, you take her, but you're responsible. So my brother took me, and I ended up in Wayne State. When I traveled, it was the first time I would travel on a plane outside Lebanon, and I was going through Switzerland. And when I got to Switzerland, I, I don't remember, maybe it was Munich, I don't know which, where in Switzerland, I was very... Uh, sad. I, you know, I was going into the unknown. I don't know my surroundings and, you know, I'm eating alone. So I went to my bedroom and I decided to sleep early, 6 p.m. And I get this phone call. And my brother was on the phone. I said, oh, so nice to hear your voice. I was like lighted up, etc. He said, come down. I'm here. He came to see me in Switzerland because he didn't want me to feel lonely. So, and from there, he took me to a beautiful uh, dinner. He was very good at meals. He knew exactly which restaurants to pick. And then he put me on the plane to the U.S. And there began, began my trip here, my life journey. And I remember the first thing that happened when I got off the plane in Detroit uh, was that they opened the door. That It was in the summer. I arrived here in June, I think, 26. 1966. It's either 26 or 22nd, I think, 1966. They opened the door and hot air blew right in my face and my eyes were <laughs> watering and I was so, you know, they were dry and I was crying. I thought, what? Where am I? What is happening here? And it was so hot for several months and then it sort of calmed down a little bit and I had already lived in the dorm. I had a wonderful uh, roommate who was very sensitive and very sweet. And one day she said, Aziza, come to the window. I want to show you something. And I go to the window and I look out and it's all white. And she said, that's the way it'll stay for many months from now. <laughs> Of course, in, she, was right. she was right. Of course, in Lebanon we had skiing, but you, you know, you went to the mountain to ski, you went to the mountain to play with the snow, and then you went down to the beach and you swam. And I, my uncle, I didn't tell you about my uncle. He also, God rest his soul in peace. He took, he was my secular uncle, <laughs> who lived life widely, celebrated life, had great friends, uh, and he would make a point of picking me up, having his driver pick me up, every noon after my ge geometry class uh, from the university, and take me to his chalet <laughs> on the beach. He had a beautiful chalet, and we would swim, and I would, then after swimming, we would eat uh, uh, on the top of the chalet and have fun till late hours of the night. So I had all this, but I didn't have it like where you had snow for six months. Right. That was a huge uh, experience for me. Now, uh, tell us uh, about the PhD program. Were there many women faculty or students in that program? Well, I came to a master's program. That the, my friend applied for a master's, <laughs> started. so I started with masters. There were there were some women, not many, but some, and they were not. I mean, I remember some of them being uh, strong personalities. They were not the kind of women you blow over. Uh, so I didn't see much difference between that and American University, which also had women in the classroom. And uh, the teachers were great. I loved my teachers. Um, and uh, we had some outstanding logicians. And I, of course, then continued along that route until this day, I think the best thing I ever did in life was to learn logic. Because even in law, it became such a great uh, 
instrument for me to use in, in explaining my various positions. And in particular, later in life, I found out that all this talk about Islamic fiqh, it's really, you know, Islamic jurisprudence, it's about logic. Okay. And even though I didn't study it in some religious school, I did it in the US, you know. And from Wayne, I actually went to Indiana and from India, I got my master's from Wayne. I decided to do a PhD and ended up at University of Pennsylvania. And there I did my uh, PhD in the logic of ethics, uh, which is called deontic logic. So I combined logic with morality, and it seems now in retrospect I was on, you know, on my way to doing law. Right. But uh, you went, probably had a different, did you have a different plan at that point? What you were gonna yes, do? I went to teach. Uh, were you going to stay in the United States to teach? Was that part Well, of initially in the 70s, when I was finishing my PhD uh, at, uh, in Philadelphia, I went back to Lebanon. I met the dean of the philosophy school in one of the universities. I also talked to some people at AUB, American University of Beirut. And I said, I'm thinking of coming back, and I'd like to know if there is a job for me if I come back. And the lady, the dean, who I was talking to at the, I think it was the Lebanese or Arab University, she said, you have a job if you come back, but I don't advise you to come back. If you have a job in the US, stay there. There is a civil war here. And I had already gotten an offer from a university in the US, and I accepted it. And basically, I had it was a wonderful university, wonderful students. I even taught people from the Corps of Cadets a course on feminism. And the guy from the Corps got the highest grade in my class. <laughs> and that, you know, shows that you cannot stereotype people, sure. right? Um, but I had some difficulties. Uh, okay, this university was... Um I, should I name it since I'm going to talk about the difficulties that I have? You can edit it out sure. if you want because my resume is way out there and people can see it. But that was Texas A&M. Okay. The deans, the, uh, the upper echelons of the university were very kind to me and appreciative of my work. I was widely published, uh, etc. Uh, but as you know, departments and schools change with the change of their leadership. And one of the leaders really gave me a very bad time. And I've written about that without naming the person or the school. But I never, I was brought up not to talk about things that are so embarrassing or um, disrespectful. So I never told the deans about this. Even though the deans, now in retrospect, now that I understand the system, they would have done something about it. So. It's not the university, it's that, it's that one person. And I remember one day, I'll give you an example of how he was relating to me. One day, uh, you know, we used to write with pencil and no computers. <laughs> and I used to use so many pencils and you have to constantly sharpen them. And then the secretary, there's one secretary for the whole department, she said, why don't you just buy an electric <laughs> uh, pencil sharpener and stop, you know, doing it manually? Because you do 20 at a time. I said, okay, but, you know, because the school, uh, the uh, department buys them. I said, I thought they were expensive. She said, no, a lot of people have them here. I said, okay, get me one. So she ordered one, and so the chair called me. He said, you ordered an electric uh, pencil sharpener. I said, yes, I did. He said, you know, it would be so much cheaper if, we, if you'd continue using the manual one, and we will hire an Arab to do the job. And you would hear this regularly, this sort of, it was. That was the worst, okay. that he will hire an Arab to sharpen my pencils, because it's cheaper than do, than buying an electric one. But he tried in many ways to make me fail, and he couldn't. And in the end, he came to me. What happened, there were other issues, personal issues about my life in, in, the, uh, in uh, College Station, and I decided to get a, um, 
Friend, my friends in philosophy, SWIP, Society for Women in Philosophy, I love women's support. They were the best people. And if I had any problems, I would go and tell them about it. And they would you know, share with me. It, it was a great relationship. And one of the women I loved in SWIP was Joyce Treblecott. Uh, she also passed away. I miss her a lot. And Joyce heard about all this. And she said, why don't you just come and do a visiting position for a year in philosophy in uh, Wash U? which is uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And I said, okay, I will. So she got me invited, and the department gave me a goodbye uh, party, and at the party, the uh, chairman took me aside, and he said, look, if you really want tenure, I'm not gonna fight you anymore. I don't wanna get a lawsuit on my hand. I realize it's not gonna work out, so if you want tenure, just stay. And I said, I've already committed. Uh, to go to Wash U, and I went there and Wash U wanted to keep me. But between the time Joyce had talked to me about uh, going to Wash U and my actually getting the offer, I had sat down and thought about what a miserable situation I was in. I was very much discriminated against in many ways, and not just by him. There were, <laughs> I mean, he discriminated against me on the basis of race. There were others who were negotiating voting for me for tenure on the basis of would you marry me? <laughs> I mean, you know, it was weird. That was like years ago. Things like this don't happen anymore. But I was, you know, I the a fortunate person to go through all of this. You know, there were when I was looking for a job, people interviewed me, and when I asked my teachers how did they like me, oh, they thought you had really nice legs. You know, I was I got a lot of that. I mean, the young women of today don't know what paradise they're living in. So I sat and thought to myself, you know, I don't like being victimized, and I don't like playing the victim. What do I do? I've written and published so many articles on feminism. My name was very well known, but they remain theoretical articles. What am I doing on the ground? And I said, you can do something on the ground the way you're going. Think of something that is more effective faster. And I thought, law or business? And I ended up thinking, law. So I applied and I got accepted to law school. Which law school? Uh, Penn, okay. where I had done my PhD ultimately. It was a great experience. I love Penn, they've been great. And so when I got the acceptance at Penn, I, already, I also got an offer from WashU and I said, I'm sorry, but now I have to go to law school. And I said, I don't know if that's a crazy decision or a good one. So I took a leave of absence from Texas A&M uh, for a year. And my first year, you know how first years are, but I still thought, I want to do this. So I then resigned. I told them I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. And then I started this other journey to law. So how was the um, composition of the class, both for women and for... There were a lot actions? of women. There were a lot of women uh, already mm -hmm. at that time. The feminist movement has taken, uh, you know, uh, its root. And I was, I think I went to law school in 82. So already, you know, law schools had made an effort mm -hmm. to get more women. There were women teachers as well. The one thing I noticed is that while women were being accepted more readily, diversity on the basis of race and diversity on the basis of race and gender in the faculty was not as progressive as it could be. For example, I, the, the, the women teachers who taught me had a hard time and they had to fight for the respect of the students. Mm -hmm. And they won it, but they have to fight for it. While the teachers, male teachers who walked into the class, you know, you'd hear whispers about he's golden, he's connected to the money tree, to the da da. And then, you know, everybody is in awe. But the woman, like, what is she doing here in a dress teaching us about torts? You know, what does she know about torts? And especially this particular person, she was an African American woman, a black woman. She's not, in their eyes, plugged into the power structure. In time, they came to love her. But I saw the whole process. Because I came in not as a young student. I came as a PhD in philosophy who had taught, a professor who had taught logic.
And I'm sitting in class and I'm, I've written about feminism and I'm seeing this play in front of my eyes. And so sometimes, for example, I would make a comment about a case, um, how a certain ruling would affect the status of the wife. And the class would be upset, no, that's not true. They don't, didn't understand um, the inner workings of society and how women could be disadvantaged. They were looking at the surface. Um, I remember I, I had a I had a very interesting experience. I, uh, I was resisted as an older student to some extent, not by everybody. I had lovely, lovely friends, but some guys, um, for example, told me not to interview the top firms on, on Wall Street because I, I was applying, you know, they come to our campus and you fill out a paper. I said, don't do it, you'll never get there. I said, well, you know, I can always try. So I had heard of both Sullivan and Cromwell and Davis Polk and I applied to both and they were laughing. They said, what a waste of time. And I got uh, offers from both and they didn't. And they were so shocked, these boys, that this woman, older lady, you know, got those two offers and I ended up doing summer in uh, Davis Polk, which I loved. And they were steering me towards litigation and I had decided, no, I really want to go into corporate and I wanted to go into Sullivan and Cromwell and do securities because securities was, in my view, about ethics, about doing things right, no deception, etc. And, the, and uh, Sullivan and Cromwell was premier in, in this field. But I loved being in Davis Polk and uh, later in life I thought maybe I would have made a great litigator, who knows. But I always thought don't do it because your accent could make the jury biased against you. That's what I thought. And Davis Polk kept saying that's not true, it'll all, all, only make them listen to you more carefully. And now that I've given speeches all over the country I realize that was the wrong reason not to go uh, lit into litigation. But the other reason for going corporate is that my family has always had a lot of international business and I wanted them to see me like on the same footing as them. <laughs> so that's why I think I ended up in corporate. How, did the, how were women treated at those two law firms? Were they in power positions? Were they treated well? What I found out in law school, remind me, remind me to tell you something about law school and diversity, but when I went to the uh, law firm, what I found out is that the more secure and the better lawyer you are, the better person you are. So some of the more senior partners, I, you know, I love them. Uh, they really were helpful, they really uh, were good mentors if I ever was close enough to them because I was a first year associate and a second year. I left after my second year. The ones in between, either who were junior partners and were not sure of themselves or the ones who were struggling for it, would not be as good. And that repeated itself in the various um, uh, firms I went to. But what I wanted to tell, and, and the way they treated women, it was very traditional. Uh, respectful, and I don't think I th I don't think there was discrimination, but the clients did. In one of the firms, not the ones I named, uh, one of the clients at one point uh, said to me, "Why don't you do for us the dance in the seven veils?" And I had sort of laughed it off until one of my associates had sued on the basis of discrimination and mentioned that event. And she had heard it and it had stuck in her mind. And clients would ask, for example, we don't want women on the team, we want all men and so on. So the real issue was not as much the lawyers usually, but the clients who forced the hand of the firm, you know, either you give us this or or we won't uh, stay. And uh, I think in time that sort of resolved itself. Mm -hmm. But that's called diversity, you understand? Yeah, I, I remember. So after I got that gem of an offer, I also was elected 
despite extreme challenges, to be the editor-in-chief of the journal. At that time, it was the business journal. I forget, it had a long name, Journal of International and Business Law or something. <laughs> and nobody thought I would be, you know, because the guys thought they would be uh, chosen, and they weren't. Um, the students who did the choosing chose me. And we had a campaign because we, our journal was not getting enough articles from the students or you know, applications to be associates and writing comments for us to choose from them. So <clears throat> we had a campaign and we went around um, the various classes telling them that we were very fair, we would look at every comment and we would uh, grade it very uh, fairly, and that uh, we believe in diversity, so clearly that was an issue at that time. And we are, we are, you know, going to be uh, a fair journal. So, some of the black students believed us, and they wrote their comments. And when I became the, uh, and of course not just blacks, there were Latinos and so on. So I, when I became the editor in chief, I said the reviewers ought to be also diverse. So it, you know, it cannot be just uh, whites judging everybody else. And there were judges in town in Philadelphia who were of different backgrounds. So there was great resistance from the student board of the journal, and some of them, not all of them about this, implying as if a black judge would grade a black paper higher than it should be. And, but the process was anonymous. Oh yeah, but he will know. And I insisted on diversity, so we got a diverse uh, group of people. I'm telling you the story because there's a lesson here. And then we sent the papers, all anonymous, to the jury, and we got back the results. And I think, I think at one point, either the papers were locked, the papers were locked up to go to the jury. And I kept looking for who locked them up and where is the key. I found out finally who locked them up, a member of our board of editors. And when I called him, he said, I went home and the key is with me. And so you're not going to have these papers. So I went to the university administration, and I remember that, uh, I wish I could remember his name now, I love him. Uh, he was, uh, uh, till today he is on the uh, administrative office at Penn, and I told him the story. He called the guy, he said, you bring the key or you don't come back to school. And the key came, and the papers went. Oh, I know, it was anonymous when they were judged and we needed the actual papers to see you know, how the results came out. And when we looked, we found out that the black jury and the white jury did the same thing. There was no difference, you know? But it was a fight to even keep our word to the student body that we will not be uh, uh, unfairly discriminating against them. So that stuck in my mind. I never, I ne that I have never experienced that firsthand, and I thought that was very uncalled for. And these were student lawyers, potential lawyers, and I'm hoping that since then they've learned their lesson. Sure, sure. And I, I'm very proud that the law school backed me up completely. There was no question. So how did you get from corporate law to law teaching? So I did securities and I loved it. I loved the due diligence part because it's research. <clears throat> and I sort of got stuck in it because I've, I've done it so well that I remember in one closing um, where we were doing an issue of securities for a very old uh, client of the and, and well-known organization, uh, you know, that our firm had uh, worked with for a long time. I found there was a defect in their articles of incorporation or something. <laughs> and when I pointed it out, everybody's face went red and they said, nobody ever caught it all these years. It was a simple thing to fix and the issue went further, you know, and it did not get stopped. But everybody was impressed many times by my due diligence, so I got stuck into that. 
And then I got into mergers and acquisitions and deals and so on, and I didn't like that. I didn't like the way we negotiate contracts. My reason for that, and they told me that I drew up very bad agreements, is that I tried to draw agreements that were fair and equitable. <laughs> and they said, that's not your job. <laughs> You're a lawyer of this party. Let the other lawyer fight for their party. But I never really accepted that theory. I thought we all should be looking out for each other. So I figured out in the end. So at one point, I thought maybe I should move somewhere else. And maybe I would, should try another experience on Wall Street before I decide I don't like doing corporate law. So I ended up with Debevoise and Plimpton. And by the way, Debevoise, till this day I'm in touch with them. They are doing pro bono work for Karama, which we will be talking about. Yeah, it's very nice. Um, and there I, it, you know, corporate law is corporate law. And you know, I was, I should tell you that when I graduated from law school, I had just married my husband, Ahmed. And when I ended up on Wall Street, uh, it would be three days before he would see me, and I would come at 7 a.m., I take a bath and say, make sure the breakfast is ready, I'd eat and run, run out back to, to work. So it was very tough. Um, but something you might not have known is that I didn't go directly from law school to Wall Street. I went to Harvard Divinity School in I between. Didn't, I didn't. I read it on your resume. Yeah. I think I was right. Only for one semester, because I didn't want to I was given a fellowship for a year, and I said, I'll only do one semester and then go, because I was insecure about my offer <laughs> at, at um, Sullivan and Cromwell. So I went there. I was at the, uh, what is it, the uh, Center for World Religions, mm -hmm. which had the most wonderful people in charge of it. Um, again, their names do not come to me right away. Um, husband and wife, Inika and, uh, and John Carmen, I think that was the name. Um, very kind, very loving. Uh, Ahmed and I just loved them. Ahmed was visiting me. He would go and he, he went to University of Chicago and he'd flo fl fly over to see me. Um, we were um, engaged, yeah, no, we were married. We were married at that time. And so I did a lot of research. I was happy to have access to the Harvard University Library. Uh, I had a wonderful semester. I gave some lectures while I was there and sort of brought me back uh, to what I've done in the past. I just wanted to do that one last thing before I go into the law. Clearly, I couldn't tear myself away. So after like doing, I ended up doing like six and a half years on Wall Street. I was sitting in my office, which was all glass and you know beautiful, you know building, etc. And I'm thinking, you know what, Aziza, you don't have a brain anymore. You know you can't have one original thought in your head. You you are brain dead. All you're doing, you're marking up agreements and uh, you know. Ch changing it a little bit here, a little bit there. And when you're done, it's on a shelf, and you're only working for the people who are paying you on corporation. You, your brain is dead. And, and I really believed that I could no longer do anything creative. And I said, what am I going to do? And it was at that time, <laughs> out of the blue, <clears throat> when I was thinking those dark thoughts, that I got a call from the uh, Case Western Reserve Journal of International Law. And they said, we'd like you to write an article for us on democracy. I said, why me? <laughs> like out of the blue. They said, well, we wanted Dr. Maher Hathout, who, by the way, he passed away two days ago, bless his soul. Uh, we asked him to write this article, and he said, he won't, but he recommended you. And at that time, they were just about starting to talk about democracy, but it wasn't like in full swing, like it became later. And I thought, that's my ticket out of Wall Street, because I knew I needed an article. I said, of course, I'll write it. When do you need it? He said, we'll give you, I think, nine months or a year. So I made arrangements with Deva Voice that I would work part-time, half-time. And the other half time, I was at Columbia University Library. 
And I search and search and search, and like three, four months passed, I couldn't find a single Islamic document on democracy. And I was panicking. <clears throat> so there was this um, a very nice and kind uh, Muslim leader and scholar. His name was Dr. Mahmoud Abu Saud, who also passed away. I have no idea how I came to know him. But we became friends. We, I would call him and ask him, you know, how he is and so on. So one day I thought, why don't I ask him about this? And I said, Dr. Abu Saud, I, I'm, I'm just done. You know, I've done everything I could. <clears throat> and I cannot find anything in the library about democracy and Islam. And I have to have the article in like six months. And he laughed. And he said, are you looking under democracy? I said, yes. He said, well, that's not what they called it. So go look under these. And he gave me the topics. And I went, and it was just a festival of information. <laughs> and I was so happy. And I, Islamic topics? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So it came under uh, state governance. Okay, sure. You know, they didn't call it democracy. They called it consultation. They called it bay'a or voting. They called it a lot of other things. Democracy is not the word they used. So after it was done, I was so proud of it. And I sent it in. And I get a letter. I think it was a letter. If it's a letter, I would still have it. It might have been a phone call from the editor who was going to look at my paper. He said, we just don't think this is true. <laughs> you know, I mean. Islam is not that democratic, and you make it look like it is. So we've hired somebody who knows the language, who's going to go over all your footnotes. And I guess she's a Middle East librarian. And, you know, well, I will get back to you. You remember, it was an invited paper. Not the first time when I give an invited paper, and because they do not like the content, I get censored. So anyway, I didn't get censored here. Uh, they did bring this person, and uh, she verified everything, but corrected all my uh, spelling of the words. Mm -hmm. So they sent it back to me, and I looked at it. And they said, so I guess, they said, I, we guess it's right. So, okay, and here it is. And I looked at it, and I said, you know, whoever reviewed my paper used Orientalist transliteration, and I will not accept it, so please reverse it and make it as it used to be. And they did. Yeah. They were very nice. After the first, you know, like, what on earth is going on? Because you remember, these are young people who've heard such horrible things about Islam, and here I come and say, no, it's not that bad. You know, they really have to do their due diligence. I don't blame them, but that was the climate I published my first article in. And I think, well, you can look at my uh, article to see what year, but I think it was 91. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the article, for, surprisingly, was read by leaders in the Muslim community, as well as the legal community. And they liked it so much, they asked for the right to reproduce it. And they did, and they distributed it on the hill to tell them, you know, to tell the congressman, Islam is not so bad, look, look what it is like. And that was my first article. I thought, hey, great, why don't I go back to teaching? <laughs> so I decided that if I'm going to go back to teaching, I'll go back on my own terms, which is I'm going to do research on Islam. Now, I'll teach corporate because I have this great wealth of knowledge from great Wall Street uh, firms, but I want to do my research on Islam, and if they're biased, I need to know ahead of time. So what I did was to read this paper, whatever I was interviewed, and leave it you know, to God and to them to decide whether they want somebody amongst them who will do this for a lifetime. So. I got many uh, interviews, one of them from a small university I'd never heard of, University of Richmond, and it was ALS. And I came and did a lot of interviews, and then I came to the Richmond interview, and they had a suite, and they had a party the night before, to which I went. 
and two professors, Gary and J.P. Jones, were standing at the door, you know, like this, and arguing because they've taken different positions as lawyers. Uh, writing briefs uh, for what is that military case about uh, allowing women to, to get in? VMI. VMI. And I stood there listening with amazement and admiration. And by the time the party was over, I was only a few steps into the, into the suite. But I like these people. The next day, I was going to the dining room and I saw Professor Clark Williams and he said, Hi, Aziza. I thought, he knows my name and it's such a difficult name. People say, how do you spell it? How do you pronounce it? So I liked them. When they invited me over, I read my Islamic paper and guess what? They had questions. <laughs> they even argued about the analysis and, you know, nothing bad. They really argued like lawyers should. And then they made me the offer. And I thought, you know, if they like what I do, then that's where I should go, because I like them. Mm -hmm. And I ended up at the University of Richmond. So um, how has that been for you as a Lebanese woman, as a woman lawyer at the University of Richmond? Um, on the whole, it was lovely. But I must say that things changed with the change of the dean. Mm -hmm. So there were ups and downs. Mm -hmm. My last semester teaching securities I was not happy with and the reason and th there I could understand if the students were not as happy as usual because I was placed on the commission by President Obama the commission for international religious freedom and when I asked about how much time it would take they said one meeting a month and on that basis I accepted it and it turned out to be every day and in, at times I took my iPad to bed because I would get emails at 3 a.m. I had to look at and I had to drive then to Richmond in the morning to teach. That was a disaster. Um, but other than that, the students in securities were very fine. The student in Islamic law also looked at me as a great resource. Things changed after 9-11. And I started getting much less students in my uh, seminar on Islam. And when I asked my, one of my students why, she told me that her two friends were going to come and take the class, but they were told it would be unpatriotic to do so. So that became the struggle that I was fighting with afterwards. And. Um, you know, our struggle doesn't ever end, whether as women, whether as Arabs, whether as Muslims, whether as, you know, I'm sure every one of us, including yourself, has something <laughs> that would make somebody discriminate. Uh, but I think on the whole, my experience at the university was really very good. It's an excellent university and I got a lot of support from the faculty and from the administration and mostly from the deans, most of the time. Looking back on your career, what do you think were your greatest accomplishments, either in the classroom or outside of the classroom? To be honest with you, I think my greatest um, Go ahead. accomplishment is the fact that I have developed a line of research on Islamic studies or Islamic law that nobody has done before. And I believe I was the first to teach Islamic law in a law school. And after that, it, uh, it became more prevalent. Uh, um, but what I'm writing is not what others are writing. And that's why I'm hoping that I'll be able to finish writing what I want to write, because I don't know that even the younger generation can yet f f uh, follow in my footsteps for a simple reason. I had the traditional religious upbringing. I had pretty good knowledge of secular society. I was brought up in American schools all the way. My English was good enough. My Arabic was fantastic. Uh, I could understand the classical Arabic of the Quran and I could read the old ancient documents and understand them. And guess what? Then I had logic. A PhD in logic, where could I apply all of that and my legal training all these things came together to give me uh, uh, credibility 
in controversial material I write that others don't have. So somebody who doesn't like what I write may say, I think she's wrong. But I think hopefully that's as far as they will go. And there are people who... They respect the they respect quality. The quality. And, and I just came from Morocco where I gave a lecture on a panel about uh, something about Islamic law from my book. I remember talking, for example, about the creation of Eve in the Quran because it was an interfaith uh, a panel and I was trying to distinguish uh, the story of creation from Judaism and Christianity. But in doing so, I had to criticize a very, very major scholar whom I love. But he just erred on a very important point. And who was leading um, the panel? <laughs> the head of the Rabit al muhammadiyya which is a highly respectable Islamic uh, scholarly institution, probably the highest or one of the highest in Morocco. So I was nervous how they, he is going to react to that. And so part of what I did was a PowerPoint where I actually took a picture of the page where the language appeared so that they will see it. And when I was done, his comment was like he really appreciated the fact that I could like a scholar very much and give him credit and at the same time be able to criticize the one place where he went wrong instead of throwing it all out as some e extremist or feminist or whatever would do. You know, he's no good, he's a patriarchal person. Yes, he was patriarchal, but so was everybody because we, they all lived in a patriarchal society, but they had good ideas. So I was very proud that um, my presentation succeeded in Morocco and succeeded very well, even with the presence of such distinguished scholars. And so I'm hoping that this trend will continue. That's good. We have just a couple more minutes and we have not covered a lot of things yet with Karama and so forth, but yeah. talk just a few minutes about Karama. So when I became a professor, uh, I decided I really need to do something on the ground because at that time, in the early 90s, Karama was established in 92, incorporated in 93, um, there were a lot of my former like feminist colleagues um, from the 60s with whom I was highly engaged who were going to the UN and other international arenas and talking about liberating Muslim women from Islam. And I thought to myself that my sisters are doing to me what they said their men were doing to them in the 60s. They're taking away my voice and they don't understand the culture from the inside. They're being Orientalists, so I have to do something about it. And that's how we initially incorporated Karama, went to Beijing, met a lot of Muslim delegations. They were very happy to see us, formed a lot of uh, alliances. The problem at Karama has always been that we didn't have enough funding uh, to do all the, to realize all the dreams we had, with one exception, and I will mention it here, it may surprise you, that uh, one year we got a grant from the Gates Foundation for a million and a half. And that was supposed to take us from our current position to a higher mid middle sized position. And one week after the grant, I was elated. One week afterwards, I was told that I had bad cancer, ovarian, and I needed to go into the hospital. That took about two years. In the meantime, between chemo and operation and recovery and all that, in the meantime, I have asked an, an unmuslim friend of mine from, from, from a law school to take over Karama and do what is, we're supposed to do under the Gates grant. And he did, and when I came back, I found out there was only one Muslim out of the nine employees. Uh, it was diverse, one Muslim, one Jew, and the rest were Christians. That it was being changed from being a scholarly organization to being about leadership. It was losing, uh, we lost our, our base. Our base would go on the internet and say, what's happening to Karama, it's not ours anymore. And the money was spent. <laughs> So I had to re-establish Karama from zero after the Gates grant. That was a very unfortunate uh, situation. But after we came from Beijing, and people, people in the country started hearing about Karama, they, we started get, I started getting calls uh, from around the country from women 
American women, Muslim, who are having problems. And then I realize there are problems at home before I start worrying about problems overseas. I remember the day when an American femi non-Muslim feminist called me and she said, because she heard about my feminist background, she said, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, family abuse, domestic abuse in Islam, in Islam, Muslim families. And I said, we don't have it, because I didn't know. And I had not really gotten into that area, and she hung up on me. So, <laughs> and I don't blame her now. <laughs> so then we started finding out more and more uh, about the situation. We started, uh, I started writing everything we want to do on, on the ground, we first write about. So I wrote about the marriage contract. I was, I think, the first to write on that topic. Others followed. Um, we wrote about domestic, I wrote, I didn't do domestic violence at Karama until I wrote the article and published it. Now we have a Department of Justice grant on domestic violence. Violence, uh, actually, uh, on, uh, no, actually on family law. I, I don't know exactly which part, and we help women by going to court even. So we've done very well. Uh, either, even my consciousness has been developing as we moved along, um, because I found out that in the U.S. We have a lot of problems, and we need to clean up these problems. I, I was one of the first who went into the Muslim community, maybe the only one, because you, you know I was the only, the very first Muslim woman tenured professor in a law school. So I would go around and lecture about law and tell, I remember till this day, tell the audience, look, you have you are sending your children to a medical school, and I'm going to ask you for a big sacrifice. Sacrifice the second child to law. <laughs> and it, there was a lot of resistance. And some imams would say, no, this is secular law. It's against our religion to send our children into law school. A woman, young woman called me crying because her dad was going to send her until the imam dissuaded him. But I kept talking. And they started seeing what's going on. And now look, we have such a great uh, number of Muslim uh, lawyers and law students. Karama itself gave birth to what is known in the Muslim community as NAML, N-A-M-L, National Association of Muslim Lawyers. Uh, NAML is mostly a listserv, but NAML gave uh, birth also to two organizations, the National Association of Muslim Law Students and also Muslim Advocates, whom they supported financially and until they could stand on their two feet. So Karama is a grandmother.